Welcome to Benefit or Beneficials. And I'm Cheryl Frank Sullivan, Re Assistant Research Professor, here with Margaret Skinner, the Extension Entomologist and Research Professor at the University of Vermont Entomology Research Lab. And for those of you that don't know us, here at the lab, we focus on integrated pest management. And much of that focus is on developing strategies that promote biological control of arthropod pests. And some of the research is focused on creating habitat plantings to support beneficial insects, which is a topic of today. So by the end of this presentation, we hope that you'll be able to know and recognize some beneficials and understand some of the issues that affect them and what habitat plantings are and what they consist of and what the insects that they attract do. Um, so this is also meant to provide uh, you with links specific to this region that can help you establish your own beneficial garden that works for you. So not only is this gonna be recorded, but the PDF with links will also be made available. And if you missed the presentation that we did in May, uh, the link is below, and that covers a lot of species identification in more detail because um, we're going to talk about some of them today. Uh, so please check that out. Um, we incorporated most of the questions that you had um, into this presentation to the best of our ability, but if they're not answered today, uh, they should be in that presentation below. So, so Sarah, wait a minute. So Kim can't hear you, oh. and I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I'm not terribly technologically uh, literate. Um, can yeah, can everybody can't... else hear me okay? Uh, yes. Great. Yeah, I can hear you too, Cheryl. Um, Kim, what you can do is next to the little uh, microphone icon on in the, it's typically in the lower left-hand side, you should see um, there's a little arrow button next to that and you can just um, click on that. And I think there's a troubleshooting audio settings piece and that should help. And if that doesn't work, you could go out and then come back in and see if that uh, works, that helps. Mm, yeah, we also have a call in. So um, you can switch to the phone audio too, right on that little uh, button too. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. So just as a quick reminder, uh, beneficial insects provide valuable services such as pest management or pollination. And generally they're broken down into three categories. There's predators that attack and eat their prey. Uh, there are um, parasites and parasitoids that lay eggs either on or within a host. And then there's pollinators that are pretty much anything that visits and disturbs a flower. And some of these actually serve multiple functions and function as pest fighting pollinators. So real quickly, uh, many things are threatening the health of our beneficials. Um, I'm not gonna cover them in much detail, but there's the combined effects from things like habitat loss, uh, pests and diseases, uh, exotic invasive species, pests, oops, pesticides, pollution, and of course, climate change. They're all taking a toll. And it's kind of tricky because impact uh, of a lot of these on pollinators is very complex and it affects different species differently. And it's really hard to say how much an effect that these have because there's a lack of long-term data sets that actually demonstrate um, the population declines. So nonetheless, uh, habitat loss is a top threat to predators and pollinators and parasites. And just like us, beneficial insects need good places to live and reproduce and hide from predators. Things like urbanization um, results in fields where wildflowers were once abundant. So we need to be diligent in restoring those lost habitats to provide these new areas for foraging. So um, with that said, there's lots of things that you can do, um, but at the um, end of the day, uh, it all comes down to how much time that you have and resources and what your own personal uh, values are. 
So it's really important to recognize the key beneficials. Um, so you actually get to know what they look like. And you really need to use uh, pesticides very carefully and it's essential to read the label. And it's interesting because we get a lot of calls from people that really fail to read the fine prints on the chemical pesticides. Uh, for example, some wasps will build nests near water and a lot of these chemicals that are available over the counter uh, must not be used near water because of the effects that they have on aquatic life. So it's really good to be judicial about using those. And of course, finally, uh, maintaining and providing suitable habitat in the form of flowering plants. That's really strange that my computer just did that. Huh. Um, so my train of thought, oh yes, so yes. And you wanna make sure you maintain flowering plants to attract and support pollinators. Um, things like providing buffer and idle areas between forest and field edges and hedgerows. Um, they're really good for foraging and nesting. And sometimes it's good not to keep your garden super tidy because a lot of species need that leaf litter in which to hibernate over the winter. Uh, and other uh, species need these secure places to uh, mate and reproduce. So for this talk, um, we're only gonna really focus on small scale um, habitat enhancement using annuals and perennials. Um, we're not gonna talk about large scale conservation strategies I just mentioned, like the meadow management and hedgerow maintenance. Uh, so for the past several years, we have been evaluating the effectiveness of habitat hedges using annuals uh, to attract the beneficials to commercial growing areas um, like uh, high tunnels, greenhouses, and nursery landscape settings um, to provide all these resources to these beneficials. And we've been assessing them for quite a while now to see what's been visiting them. Okay, so what plants can be used to attract them? Okay, long story short, there's a lot of options, but it's really important that when you're establishing a garden that there's things you wanna take into consideration. You really wanna consider the bloom period of the plants that are chosen because these plantings really need to provide a continuous source of floral resources from spring to fall. And many of these attractive plants are in shades of blue in yellow because that tends to be the color that is preferred by a lot of pollinators. But other colors are attractive too, like reds and, and whites. And these plantings need to be a diversity, um, <clears throat> they really need to be a diversity of heights and have a diversity of flower sizes because each species has a preference uh, for certain flowers and heights over others. For example, uh, many aphid parasites, uh, parasitic wasps like to forage on really small blossoms. But again, it really depends on how much time and space you have and what type of beneficials that you wanna attract and if you wanna choose native versus non-native plants. So one low maintenance strategy uh, is the use of perennials. Um, the use of native versus non-native is a topic of great debate, uh, but there's many uh, benefits to using native plants and mainly that's because they're adapted to the environment in which they naturally occur, but also to the species that use them. And importantly, we really want to stay away from um, those really invasive perennials like butterfly bush. Um, even though it's really attractive, um, it can be really bad because it can be really invasive, but it's not to be confused with butterfly weed, um, which is a native. So here are some examples of some of the native plants that are, you know, tried and true and very very attractive to pollinators and beneficials like purple coneflower, um, which I mean, it's native to the East, but not to Vermont specifically, um, like mm -hmm. Penstemon, um, Black-Eyed Susans and wild, wild Bergamot are all very, very attractive. Oh, and the, the links below, uh, the links below um, are some publications that go into to great deal about the use of perennials for, for beneficials. Now, why aren't you working? Huh. Ah, there we go. Okay, so like I just said, uh, there's been a ton of work done on the use of perennials for pollinators, um, but this resource in particular is 
very informative for Vermont. And it's great because it's in a table format. It's multiple pages long. And it really summarizes the needs of each plant in terms of sunlight availability, um, their sunlight needs, uh, their heights and bloom periods. And I really encourage um, you to check this out if you haven't already seen it. It's just, it's just fantastic. So um, another option is to make a garden of annual flowers. And here are some examples of flowers that we've been using that are we found to be quite attractive. There's a uh, fire wheel, zinnias, sunflower, um, marigolds, plain coreopsis, cornflower, purple vervain, alyssums, cosmos. These are these are great. We've been using these. Um, they all provide a diversity of floral sizes and heights. And these really bloom midsummer through frost when they're established by direct seed. And they make really beautiful cut flower arrangements. And at the time, that was a primary function of testing these because they were for growers that already grew these for a cut flower arrangement. So there was a little economic incentive there. Um, but some of these like alyssum and marigold will bloom earlier if, if started uh, by seed inside, you know, before the last frost. And with this, we put a lot of uh, brochures at these locations to encourage the public to consider starting their own habitat hedges because they, they are quite, quite showy. And with a lot of these fall blooming plants, uh, we really hope that the beneficials will overwinter in the vicinity of plantings to emerge in the spring ready to provide pest management and pollination. You know, for an example, bumblebee queens, um, they survive winters after mating in the fall and then they establish a new colonies in the spring. So they really need those fall um, resources in order to make it and, and do their thing. So the next few, um, few slides are examples of some of uh, the habitat plantings that we established. And first, I really wanna give a special thanks to this year's Demo Habitat Strip Host Farm. It's Honeyfield Farm. And the, the weather person was just really wrong about the weather today, which is really, which is really disappointing. Um, but of course we went on there, probably would have rained. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. But either way, their farms, a, it's a 35 acre farm in Norwich and it's the um, home of the former Kildeer farm. It's run by Valerie Woodhouse and Eli Hirsch. Um, they used to be part of River Berry Farm in Fairfax and they grow 15 acres of certified organic vegetables and distribute them um, to at their farm stand CSA and farmers markets. And they are certified organic and they also have a really awesome selection of greenhouse ornamentals and perennials. And they use a lot of biological control agents in general, and they're just wonderful folks. And we're really sorry that the weather just couldn't make up its mind. But either way, they have a, a lovely 100 foot strip there. Um, of course, a drought uh, was pretty tough down there this time of year. So um, a lot of sunflowers really, really liked it. And some of the other ones, not so much so like, like alyssums, because alyssum sometimes doesn't like it when it's really hot and dry. Um, but it's, it's lovely and it was buzzing with activity and they do have a farm stand there and you can do self-guided um, walks. So please check them out if you can. Okay, here are um, some examples and... Hmm, okay, so here's some examples um, in high tunnel crops, um, some different flowering um, arrangements. Um, particularly lissum, um, dills. Um, there's some other plantings. That was from another project, but you can see there's some habitat strips in some uh, herbs as well as some tomatoes. And here are some of the strips along uh, greenhouse and nurseries um, in, in their settings. There's one in the bottom left-hand corner is um, was established for, for mum crops. Um, and the top is uh, next to uh, perennials and also in, in mums in, in the fall. And this lovely site we talked about earlier, we, <laughs> we came across this down at the Quinlan's Covered Bridge in Charlotte and Margaret found it last week when she <laughs> drove past. And I just had to go down and take a look at it and take some pictures and we just, love the fact that there's a unbelievable beneficials poster next to the master gardener extension sign so so 10 thumbs up to those who created this it's it's beautiful I, we, we love we we love to we love to see it 
Okay, and here are some of the demo boxes that we have here at the entomology research lab here in Burlington off Spear Street. If anyone's around, you know, you're more than welcome to drive by and take, take a look at these. Um, we're right off Spear Street, 661 Spear Street. Um, this is something that we are monitoring using uh, blue vein traps and blue vein traps are a very popular way to sample for flowering uh, beneficials, particularly bees, because bees are really attracted to the blue and, and the yellow. So we're trying to make a reference collection to catalog um, the exact species that are, are visiting this habitat strip, because sometimes it's really hard to visually inspect them because they fly around so, so quickly. It's hard to get a definitive ID on the fly. Um, if you will, huh, on the fly, no, no pun intended. So please check these out if you get a chance. Okay, so bee boxes, um, a lot of these sites, um, we put some of these bee boxes in just because it added an additional attractant uh, for the public to view. And also it's really good to provide suitable habitats uh, for bees that nest in tunnels and cavities. However, these can have some drawbacks because these houses can attract and allow the establishment of parasitic wasps and flies. So they really have to be maintained and cleaned annually. The links that are below talk all about that um, if you wish to do the bee box thing. And in this picture is actually really, really interesting. That's a solitary potter wasp. And it's a cavity nester and it's a predator of caterpillars and larvae of other insects. And they actually really like these bee boxes too, it, it discovered. So, so yes, not, not only bees use them, but other, other beneficials as well. So that one decided to take up residence right there. Okay, so what has been visiting these hedges? Um, the last time we analyzed our data, um, we found out that a lot of orders visit them, but primarily it's the bees and the flies, and they really um, comprise over half of the visitors to these. And if you look, and if you look a little bit more closely um, to the breakdown there, let's look at the Hymenoptera or bees and wasps. Bees were the primary primary constituents, followed almost equally by large and small wasps, and a lot of these small wasps are, were parasites of aphids, where the larger ones like hornets um, are predators of caterpillars um, and beetle larvae and other, and other larger, rather larger pests. And here is a video that for some reason is being a little finicky here. There you go. So here's a video of some of the, the bees that we found visiting on a nice bright blue sunny day. Ah. And here are some more bees that we observe visiting the habitat plantings on different flowers, on the cosmos. Well, that's a little blurry up, oh, there it is. Hopefully I don't get too dizzy watching this. There's one on the bachelor button. There's another species. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm not going to spend 
a lot of time on the B groups because I want to refer you to the presentation that we mentioned earlier um, because it, it covers all of these in in uh, in great detail. But um, what I will mention is that they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, and they all vary in their nesting strategies and if they're solitary versus living in colonies. But generally, they fall into um, the basic uh, categories that are listed on this slide. And this slide really demonstrates the importance of providing plants that bloom at different times of the year. So each bee species um, or category has these peak activity periods during the snow-free times of the year. And the chart that is on the right, um, it's in respect to fruiting trees, but you can see um, that the categories of bees are active at different times. Um, it's really, really, really fascinating. And the links that are below uh, are, are great because they provide a lot of uh, detailed ID charts and keys to help you identify what um, bees are visiting your habitat plantings and, and what time what time of the year. So I encourage you to please check those out when you when you can. Okay, so parasitic wasps. Although many are tiny and they have a very limited role in pollination, unlike their larger relatives, it's really essential that they feed on nectars in order to produce eggs and have energy to find hosts. So some of these are commercially available to purchase, like the egg parasite trichogramma and the aphid parasitoid aphidius. But many of these occur here naturally, and they lay their eggs on or within the host, and then the larva develops uh, inside, and it predates on the insides of the host as they grow. So as they develop into pupa, they're encased in these mummies, which are shown for the aphidius. That's looking a little blurry, actually, on my end there. Oops. But anyway, those brown things are actually uh, mummies, and that has a developing pupa in there. And the prey on, they actually um, put the mummy on a little pad because they kind of come out to um, pupae underneath it. But it's really, really cool. But for the most part, um, the adults feed on nectars. But some, some of these small wasp species actually will host feed as well. Okay, so next uh, we see a lot of flies. So the flies that we've observed, most of them are syrphids, which are very important pollinators, and many provide pest management by predating on aphids and other small pests. And to a lesser extent, we saw tachinids, which are parasites of beetle larvae and caterpillars. And then there's a bunch of others that do a whole bunch of other things like pollination, but probably do not provide much pest management. And just to recap, um, some important differences between flies and bees and wasps are that flies only have one pair of wings and bees and wasps have two pairs. So they have four wings versus two wings in total. Oh, look at that, that just moved forward. Well, since we're moving forward anyways. Okay, hoverflies. Uh, hoverflies are incredibly diverse. And they're fairly easy to identify um, on the fly because the adults hover over the flowers. And these mimic bees and wasps who scare off predators. And to tell them apart from bees, other than the fact that they have two wings, they also tend to have very short, stout, bristle-like antennas where bees tend to have uh, much longer. So as adults, they feed on the pollen nectar and nectars of plants and the, their larvae or maggots are actually predators of many aphids and other um, soft body pests. And, and, and some of them actually will consume dead and decaying organic matter as well. Um, and in cold regions, they overwinter in the pupal stage and emerge as adults in spring. But in warmer places, they'll overwinter as adults. And, and for many of these species, it's really unclear how their overwintering um, strategy kind of um, works. So it's because there's so many species, but they're, they're very fascinating. They're very important. Um, 
and they're really important pollinators, uh, some more so than bees, like at really high latitudes because they can adapt to quite a wide range uh, of climates and elevations. Okay, so this slide shows um, examples of several hoverfly species that we commonly see here in Vermont. And the stars indicate that the larvae are actually predators of pests. And when there is no stars, those have larvae that are that feed on dead and decaying uh, matter. And some of these, like the bald-faced hornet fly and the orange-legged drone fly, they are really good at mimicking like a bumblebee or a bald-faced hornet. Um, so sometimes you might mistake them for one, one or one or the other. So it's, it's sometimes good to get a nice close look there. And then there's the Eastern Hornet fly too. I mean, those, those are pretty cool, cool as well. Um, but really around here, we tend to see the Eastern calligrapher quite, quite frequently. Um, we also see the transverse banded drone fly quite a bit um, in the smooth tail. And we, we do, we see, we see a lot of these um, quite extensively. And not all of them hold their wings kind of V-like. Some of them like the thick le legged hoverfly, they, they hold their wings over their back at rest. Um, so sometimes it's kind of hard to tell because you wouldn't really think that it would be a seraphid fly, but they're, they're incredibly, incredibly diverse and very important. All right, so to canids, uh, a few facts about them. They're really mostly nondescript black or grayish flies. And they could be mistaken for house flies, but in general, they're much hairier. Uh, they're parasitic on a wide variety of insects like spongy moth caterpillars and Japanese beetle um, adults. Uh, for example, the winsome fly is a tachinid that was native to Japan and they were actually released in the wild um, in the early 1900s to combat the Japanese beetle. And the small white eggs uh, that you see on those Japanese beetle um, are most likely that, that tachinid. So after the larva hatch, they penetrate into the host and they develop within, and then they burrow out of the carcass to pupate on the ground. Very fascinating. Okay. So a lot of true bugs are actually sap sucking insects uh, that damage plants and are plant pests. But a lot of these are, but some of them are predators on soft bodied insects and they prefer to suck the juices out of the prey instead of plants. And the minute pirate bug or aureus insidiosus is one of those. And aureus is a general predator of aphids, mites, thrips, and small caterpillars. And the egg to adult takes approximately 20 days and there tends to be two generations per year in the north. Usually you start to see these a lot more in August, late July, August through September. And the reason why is because they enter this reproductive diapause in response to decreased day length. Uh, they tend to overwinter as adults in, in the leaf litter. But it's also important because these are commercially available to, to purchase for biological control in greenhouse ornamentals and high tunnels um, and other places. But if you provide them the right um, cultivated plants like alyssum and marigolds, these native populations can, can be attracted in. And they, they really, really like sunflowers as well. <clears throat> okay. So there's a lot of lady beetles that we also find uh, attracted to these plantings. Granted, a lot of these are introduced species like the seven spotted lady beetle. And of course there's the Asian lady beetle that we're all familiar with and um, that checker spot, which you may not be um, familiar with, but there's also, um, you know, the ones that are, that are natives, like, like the per parenthesis. Oh, I can't even say that. And, and the variegated and the cojamilla or the pink spotted, um, those, those are frequently found on, on the habitat plantings. Um, but it's really cool to inspect the habitat plantings really regularly to get to know what's visiting them because you never know because you might actually rediscover something on it like the two spotted lady beetle that was just rediscovered after 25 years back here in Vermont 
this past summer and it was kind of locally. Um, so yeah, you never know what, what's visiting them, but it's it's great because um, they're there and who knows who knows what you might find. Um, so these beetles are predatory as adults, but also they're in their larval stage and their larva look like little mean alligators. And a lot of times it can be mistaken for pests because they're so menacing looking, but they're, they're really good. And if you're really interested in cataloging um, what you find um, for the Searfids, that slide I showed before, that was from my naturalist. That's a great uh, resource in general. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, and also there's, the Vermont Lady Beetle um, project. And that's also something that's on um, a naturalist uh, and it's the Lady Beetle Atlas. And there's also the Lost Lady Beetle project that's um, going on in New York as well. Um, there's great resources to identify all the lady beetles that you might find. And there's opportunities to submit specimens um, from a citizen scientist perspective. So great, great resources to check out. Okay, so of the annuals that we tested. Uh, sunflower, zinnias, and alyssum and cosmos seem to be the most attractive. However, beneficials were observed to visit all the plants that we had tested. And moving forward in the next few slides, I just want to show um, some pictures of just the beneficials, mostly flies and bees that have been, have been visiting these different plants. Okay, and so here's just some pictures of um, bees and searfid flies that like to visit the fire wheel um, or zinnias. And you can tell there's that yellow and reddish colors seem to be really attractive to those. And of course, sunflower. Um, there's a fun one, a pale green assassin bug that was crawling. We didn't talk about that one, but assassin bugs um, are also attracted to these. And they're another one that's like to suck the contents out of you know, a lot of soft-bodied prey. Uh, Aureus, um, in, the lower, in the lower corner, they really, really, really like sunflowers as well. Um, and it's really hard to see them with your naked eye. Sometimes you might see them crawling around, but what we do is we take a white piece of laminated paper or any white substrate, and we, we take the plant and we, we tap it off like this, the blossom off and all these little tiny parasitic wasps and small bugs like aureus that are in there foraging within the blossoms will will come out um, of them and you could actually assess them that way to see to see if they're present but definitely beautiful sunflowers in different shades of reds and mostly oranges and and yellows are very attractive uh, blue cornflower blue blue and purple they're striking something else that's also um, highly attractive and, and it's quite beautiful. I really love, I love cornflowers, but thrips also like them as well. So it's really important that um, you check these to make sure that there's not a lot of pests. Um, and I can say that sunflowers, uh, tarnished plant bugs seem to really like those and zinnias, Japanese beetles really like zinnias. So if you're wondering what kind of pests those attract, um, off the top of my head, that's what <laughs> we, we have observed uh, in the past. Uh, and here's a few pictures from Cosmos and the Coreopsis of some of the visitors. And these, these are all taking off, off our habitat uh, plantings over the years. And there's a, a wasp visiting, just kind of perched up there in the Cosmos, waiting to leap on some poor prey. Of course, the Aureus, it's a little blurry. It's hard to get good pictures of Aureus. They're just so tiny that, you know, I say I have really good iPhones and good good macro lenses. It's just really, <laughs> it's really kind of difficult. Okay, one of the questions asked um, what the best plant was to attract spider mite and aphid beneficials. And alyssum, alyssum is a top choice for that. So not only does our work um, show that it's attractive, but a lot of research has been done looking at alyssum uh, intercropped in lettuce production, uh, more specifically on the West Coast uh, to attract searfid flies for aphid management. Um, it's also very uh, attractive to aureus, and it's also used a lot as habitat plantings in greenhouse ornamental production. Um, yeah, because when you have greenhouse ornamentals, a lot of times early season, 
there's really nothing flowering. So a lot of the beneficials that you release into these production areas, um, there's nothing for them to feed on and they need those floral uh, resources in order to reproduce more effectively. So alyssum has been used quite a bit um, in greenhouse ornamentals to do that for aureus when they come out of that diapause stage, when they, when they need those resources uh, the most. Um, yes, yellow marigolds, I didn't, didn't talk about marigolds a lot. I think Margaret would be angry, angry if I didn't mention much about marigolds. <laughs> Uh, but marigolds are also uh, very attractive to aureus in our plantings, but it's also attractive to thrips as well. Um, but a lot of smaller arthropods um, can do well um, within, within marigolds. On oh, here is, oh, I'm going to play. Let me see. And here is a wonderful hoverfly. hanging out on alyssum. Oops. Okay, so um, one uh, last remark that I wanna mention about uh, gardens is that uh, it's really important to delay the removal of debris because that can help out a lot of uh, beneficials. So you have things like stem nesting bees, like leaf cutters, uh, mason, and those carpenter bees. They really like those hollow um, pithy plants. And these are some examples on this slide of some of those um, pithy plants. Um, yeah, we switched from annuals to perennials here. Um, but it's just good to leave those dead flower stalks over the winter and stuff for them to hibernate within. And the same thing can go for those annual plantings because it provides some refuge, um, unless you find they're becoming a real issue with pests. Like for the annual plant, annual plantings, you might have to rotate them someplace else if they become too, what is going on here? If they become too uh, much of an issue with, with pests. Um, but if you have these and, you should wait till over spring to cut the dead blossom heads off because um, you want to leave those stalks for those females to lay eggs in and you want the larva to, to, to develop. Um, and the same can go for uh, delaying lawn mowing also because it allows for those early flowers early on. So there's a lot of um, options there with delayed, delayed mowing. Same thing with goldenrod. Um, that's also something that's very attractive later on in the season. Um, so something to consider leaving some of that for your beneficial buddies. Okay, so really a take home message is that um, you can make a difference for the survival of these beneficials and you can build your own beneficial community within your garden and, and beyond. And you really wanna monitor these for beneficials and pests, um, just to make sure um, everything's in check. And you never know when you might rediscover one and it's important to have um, you know, those observations on, on plantings and, and to record them because you never know, you might find um, something that's been lost for a really long time might just pop up again um, because more people are providing habitat to encourage them to come back and to reestablish. So it's really important. And I mean, it's, it's really overwhelming, um, all the flower choices that are out there, um, but the resources, oh, what is going on? But the resources are available um, and a lot of them are in the links there in this presentation as well as this presentation. There's a lot of links um, in this one as well. And it also talks more in depth about uh, the different bee species and other beneficials that, that are attracted. Um, but hopefully now um, we have some more resources to build a better, a better beneficial garden. Oh, look at that. Speaking of more resources, here's more resources, um, but a lot of them are very specific to this region. And that is all that I have to talk about um, in the slides. So thank you very much. Um, this was great and thanks for, for coming.